jacket had been catching on everything, and it's not fun in a bathroom either. I noticed I finally was like, this can be really bad if I'm not careful of this thing. So I was wrapping it around, my, trying to keep it from. But anyway, I want to go ahead and get started. Um, it was funny, uh, just a few minutes ago, I was thinking about, well, what time Adam said, I'll probably <clears throat> be finishing around 8.40, so I was thinking I'll try to, you know, do the same thing, so they won't complain about the women going over, which happens a lot, actually, and so it made me think, um, one of the, of course, Adam speaks a lot more than I do, you know, being a preacher, and he told me once, I was asking him, I had a certain amount of time, I was like, how many words now generally these are my notes i just you know write i, I usually have not taken the time to spend I, years ago when the kids were little i thought i can barely have the time to write these things out think clearly enough to make a plan for a lesson much less than take time to type so i just kind of got out of that habit but but one day i was really gonna make a effort to type out the lesson and I wanted to know about how many words you know if you have a 30 40 minute lesson and of course he knows exactly you know the how many words he said and I don't remember you know for 35 minutes it's usually about these many hundred words and so, so that's what I had and 35 minutes went by and I was like we do not teach in the same way, apparently, because I must have been ad-libbing way too much, being uh, much more probably of a woman, of course, than he is. <laughs> so I always learn my lesson that probably what I think I can do in a few minutes is going to take longer. So I hope that this is actually the hardest part of knowing about how long to speak. But uh, Tonight's lesson, our breakout session for tonight, uh, was titled, Things I Want My Children to Know. I think... The, the flyer or the program said uh, 20 things. I think there's 20 here. I know I've rearranged some uh, uh, and maybe renumbered. So if, you're, if you write notes, if you take notes, you may come up with 21, I don't know, maybe 19. But, but we're gonna go in and I'm gonna maybe try to number, but probably I'm gonna forget to do that. So, but we'll definitely have breaks. And this lesson really is just intended to get us to think about being intentional with our time with our children. You know, sometimes we get, and this is very common, I, I was thinking, and Adam already spoke about this earlier, that when you teach about parenting or about marriage or anything like that, it's, it is really hard because, you know, you're, you're studying and you're thinking about what you want to be for your kids, what you want your family to be like. And we all know that sometimes things just don't work out like you're wanting them to. You know, we, we, we try, or maybe we have good intentions and life gets in the way. And so sometimes we go uh, so long and we, we just, maybe it's a source of discouragement. But so these lessons, keep that in mind. But also specifically for this one, there's, you know, 20 things. That's a lot to talk, there's, that's a lot to talk about in about 40 minutes or so. And so we can't spend a lot of time on each one, but we will spend t more time on a lot of these tomorrow. So if there's something that's, yeah, that's true, you know, I want to maybe hear more about that, then, you know, come back tomorrow and you'll get to hear most of these. We'll talk a little bit more in one or the other lesson tomorrow. There'll be two uh, on my part tomorrow. But also, and this lesson specifically kind of came from the idea of when you're parenting, that it's a good idea to know these things that you actually want your children to know. That it's not just a we'll just wait and see how everything turns out game. That's easy to think and easy to live. Like, well, we'll just see how they turn out. And we all know to a point that that's true. We can't control the things about our kids that, that as they grow older, they are what we call free moral agents and they're gonna make their decisions hopefully based on what we've taught them, hopefully things that we are uh, hoping and praying for them. Did that just come on louder? Oh, wow. I was thinking that I... <laughs> so hope as we go through these things, I want you to think about the, the plan or the my, my idea about this is to get us to think about the being intentional. And, and if I want this for my children, if I want our family to be this way, then that happens 
from the day-to-day -day decisions we make. And so a lot of these things, this is what I want them to know, but all we, what we need to do is, in your mind, and in, in the, my mind, as I've thought about this, think, if I want them to know this, then what daily actions? It won't happen by accident, okay? Some of these things are very important. Some of these things you may, I hope most of these you would agree on. Some of these things you may think, well, whatever, I don't. But if these are things that are important to you, let's try to make a plan to do what we can every day in our lives with our children to make sure that we are implementing things that will give this a better uh, chance of turning out the way we want. Um, so, um, and also, let me see, I want to make sure I'm, okay, so, so we're going to go ahead and get started. There's about 20, and they're not really in really in any particular order. These ones are the, the most important, though, for me, so I did start with the first things that came to my mind when I was thinking about these things and making my own personal list. So the first thing I want my children to know is that God is real. That sounds like a very, well, of course, but that is not as easy to achieve in our society maybe as it used to be. You know, back when most of us possibly were growing up, it was just kind of a given that, that we had a very um, religious, you know, maybe church-oriented society more, and people were exposed to religion more. They, it was very common for them to hear about, to talk about, and that's just not the case anymore. In fact, religion is becoming, and I'm talking about in a broad sense here, it's becoming something that people scoff at. They kind of make fun of. They uh, even uh, villainize if you're a religious person. I mean, have you read comments or had heard statements that that was just thrown out like a, um, not a compliment. What's the opposite of a compliment? That just left my head. Like it's a insult. Thank you. Where did that word? Wow. Yeah, it's thrown out like an insult. You know, like, you know, religion this, religion that. So I want my kids to know that God is real. I don't want to just assume that they're going to pick that up because we go to church all the time. There are a lot of kids who go to church, and I have personally known them, who by the time they leave their home have pretty much told their mom and dad they're not sure they even think God is real. And their moms and dads are just thrown for a loop because they thought, what in the world? We've, we've done church. We've gone. We've taken you to Bible class. We've done this. We've done that. We've tried to live a good life. And all this time, something else was in their ear. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. But I think that should be definitely something we all should uh, want for our kids. Um, I think we should know, We I want my kids to know, this is the second one on my list, is that I want them to know about apologetics. And I know that's a word that we don't use a lot. Some people maybe are more familiar with it than others, but you know, apologetics just means a defense. And if we're talking about it in the light of a Christ, Christian apologetics, it's a defense for God, a defense of God, or in, in to maybe plead God's case. And it's not the same as religion. Knowing apologetics is not the same as knowing your Bible, which we'll talk about in a minute. But there are so many ways. You know, the, the best thing you can do if this is something important, uh, because of what we were just talking about earlier, is that you could use a site like apologeticspress.com. If you're not familiar with that and you're raising children, I just don't think I could plead with you hard enough to make that something you start doing with your children. You get those, you know, little magazines that they they send out and whatever age your kids are, if they're older and you feel like, man, I've just kind of dropped the ball on that, you know, that's okay, you know, as we make mistakes, but if we're trying to fix that, and this is a good place to start. Go to their website, and there's all kinds of articles. They produce books that address, you know, like are there discrepancies in the Bible, or they produce books about the uh, refuting evolution, and, and give your kids the tools to, to know that outside, you know, you can't, if someone doesn't believe in God, you can't use the Bible to try to prove that there's a God. I mean, you, you can get there eventually using the Bible, but you have to start way before that. And, and that's, 
it, it's a little harder because we don't talk about apologetics a lot in our congregations. You don't hear very many sermons about it. Sometimes it's really just a thing you have to do on your own, uh, sadly, sometimes. And so use those... Um, Use those sites like apologeticspress.com. They have a couple of books for maybe a little, I'm trying to think, maybe like eight-year-olds, eight to 12-year-olds. You know, is God real? That's a perfect place to start with that age group. How did, how, did, uh, how did we get the Bible? Because, you know, a lot of times when people try to tell our children about the Bible, it was just written by men, it's nothing special, but that, that little book walks them through things about the Bible that that they can believe in and they can to trust. And then the other one that is God real. It talks about all the scientific laws and it helps them. You know, they, I was in our, my children are 16 and 17 years old and, and we still work on this. They, they're not there. And, and I've, I've also had the privilege of homeschooling them. So a lot of our science lessons, this is built in, but I think even if, even if you don't, um, maybe have that scenario and your children are, are in school somewhere else, we could still use these tip tools because they need to see that things like the, call, the laws of science do not, the actually creation and the flood are, they don't uh, disagree with the laws of science. And a lot of the things, you know, when we talk about the age of the earth, I heard a lesson just this last week about the fossil record and how it actually disproves evolution if you are looking at it through the lens of a global flood and what that meant and it was so interesting and, and you know those are the kinds of things I'm talking about just to expose your children to let them watch some videos those are on that website too by the way little short ones too and so just make a start somewhere and I think that's invaluable for your children and so then the third thing on my list I told you we'll talk more about these uh, through tomorrow but I want them to know God's Word. I don't want their Bible to just sit on a shelf. I want them to be familiar, even as children. And there are so many ways we can do this. I mean, a lot of times we, we would hope our Bible school programs are actually teaching the Bible. And that if your children have grown up at a place going to Bible class for years, that they should know some things about the Bible. But I think we all know in some places that's probably... Maybe they could do a little bit better about actually teaching the Bible. Maybe you want to do better for your own children, and that's your that's what we ought to be about. So I want them to know, I want them to know about the, the chrono chrono I can't ever I can't talk today. What is wrong with me? The the narrative of the Bible, the chronology of the Bible. I want them to understand it. And I want them to, to be able to be familiar with it enough that it's not intimidating. Have you ever known people who maybe push the Bible aside, maybe they don't want it, even at church they don't really want to open up their Bibles more, and you've, I've wondered, is it because they're intimidated? Like when someone says, turn to Obadiah, and you're like, eh, oh, okay, I'll just listen, and you smile and listen. I know we all do that to a point sometimes, but I want my children to know more, and, you know, be able to, to know about this now. This is something that has been a years, years of me thinking how to do it better, how to do it better. I can't promise you that I think I have one that knows more and I think I have another one that I'm thinking, where have you been when you've heard people talking about this? And one thing we tried to do uh, is just even a little simple Bible story book um, a few years ago when I realized that uh, this one in particular didn't really know as much as I thought about the Bible stories, you know, and what had happened in this one and that one. So, um, I don't know. That should be something we work toward. I told you these are really quick. We'll talk more about them tomorrow, most of these. But I want your brains to be thinking this weekend about that's something I need to work on. And I want to come back. I want to listen. I want to, you know, maybe think about this overnight and, and start making some decisions ahead of time that this is something I'm going to have as a goal. I think that would be good for all of us. Uh, and the next one on my list is I want them to know the mind of God as much as we can know the mind of God. I, and, of course, we do that by knowing God's Word, but you can know a lot of facts about the Bible, and you're not really learning about 
the God of the Bible. I think, you know, that's if you are just wanting to read, just to read, and you make it quote story after story, but if it's not impacting your life, then you're not really learning about the mind of God. So I want my I want my kids that's something I want for them is that that the Bible is not just memorizing and quoting back the Bible lesson that they heard on Sunday or whatever. I want them to be able, I want to see and want them to know that it should change the way they live and change who they are. And so that's something um, I want to work with them on. Um, along with that, I want them to know God's purpose for their life. I taught a lesson not long ago about God's purpose. I can't remember. I think it was called Made for This. It was a like, girls' youth rally. And I thought it was interesting, the lady who was in charge of this, she said, I, you know, I really get concerned because she said, I've talked to so many young girls, she was specifically mentioning, that feel like they have to have this mysterious understanding of God's specific will for them. And I don't think we can always do that. I don't think that that's really biblical that we read, and we certainly can't read about our names, our personal names in the Bible, and know well, this is what God wanted for Leah. Fine, but we can know generally what He wants our, our you know, what He wants for us. But, but the way I talked to them that that evening about this is that God does have a purpose for each of us, though He has a purpose for all of us. And sometimes we are so physically minded that we miss this. And this is very important compared to what we were just talking about earlier, about knowing that God is real. So I'm trying to put these things together really quickly before we move on to some things that are a little bit different on my list. But when you think about someone understanding God's purpose, it's a big question. Why are we here? What are we doing in this world? Have you... I mean, I'll put myself, I'll, I'll put myself out here. Have you gone through things in your life that have just sent you spiraling down and you're finding out maybe why there are some people that start losing their faith in God because things happen to them? And, you know, if you've never been there and you've never had doubts creep up that scare you to death, I mean, I don't want that for my kids. I don't want them to think because they lose a spouse or they lose their parents or, you know, their husband leaves them or what, whatever. They lose a child in, in some kind of tragedy that all of a sudden they start questioning. Or even just day-to-day -day living like, if God loved me, if he was caring about me, why is life so hard? And how many people start turning their backs and they start questioning and doubting? I think it's interesting how many people in, church, in our churches, when something is wrong in their life, that's when those thoughts thoughts come. We don't really doubt God, right? When things are going great and we have the jobs and the promotions and, and the house that we wanted, we're, we're able to get and all of this. But then it usually comes when there's a life-altering illness or a death. Something happens like that and they just don't, don't understand. And they are so sincere. It's heartbreaking. And I think we struggle with that more because we don't really know the purpose of why we're here. If you, have you read the book of Job? When you read the book of Job, if you have doubts, if you are wanting to help someone who does have doubts because of some life tragedies, take them to the book of Job. Because, you know, we understand that Job just went through one thing after the other. It, wasn't, it doesn't appear that it was after, you know, all 10 years, bad things. You know, it, it appears like it hit him hard. Children gone, house gone, business gone, he, his health. Do you know why that was happening, though? Do you remember that at the very beginning of the book of Job that the devil is going to and fro, trying to find someone? I want to turn there because I don't want to misquote what he actually asked God. This is so important, though. Um, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. This is chapter 1, verse 6. And then verse 7 says, The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. 
What was he doing? He's trying to find people he can destroy. He's wanting to destroy people. And when he's wanting to destroy people, it's more than just their house and their family. What's he really wanting to destroy? Their faith in God. He's wanting to destroy their soul. And it's just amazing. God says, have you considered my servant Job? How would you? Do you know Job never knew this? As far as we can tell, he never knew that God is the one that said, have you tried him? It, it's, it, that gives me goosebumps. Because of watching people suffer so much, what's the first thing they want? They, it's natural. It's, it's natural because the devil's there trying. That's his, pur his, his purpose for us is for us to question God. But God wasn't up there, and God didn't make him stop. God, you know, said there's some limits here, but have you tried this? And the purpose was because it seems to me that there's this battle. There is a battle. It doesn't seem to me. There is a battle between good and bad. And we read verses that talk about the evil forces are against us. And that's just talking about the devil and his, his armies and angels. And we need to know, I, this is something that as our kids get older, we should be teaching them. But there is a battle out there. This is not just a physical world. There are things spiritually going on around us that we can't see that God, you know, the scriptures tell us that, that this, this battle is going on. And really the battle is just, it's over us. It's over our souls. It's, it's the devil wanting us to turn our backs on God. And the devil's convinced that we only serve God that's what he says. Uh, he said, uh, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him in his house and all that he has and on every side? And you bless the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. He said, but he, the devil's telling uh, God this. He's saying, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he'll curse you. And then here we are. And this is where I feel convicted and just low down sometimes. Here I am, and I make the same mistake where, you know, the devil is accusing me of saying, just if you let bad things happen, they'll, he'll curse you, she'll curse you. And sometimes what, what do we do? We fall right in step. We say, why is God doing this? What, what did I do to him? I've tried my best. And have you had these thoughts? I've had these thoughts about things, hard things in life. So... I want my kids to know that there are going to be trials. The Bible tells us you will suffer persecution. The Bible tells us that in this world you will have, Jesus himself said, in this world you will have tribulation. But then what did he say? But I have overcome the world. He's teaching the, his apostles then that the world is not all there is. And we don't need to let the trials of this world to help to convince us that God is not taking care of us and that he doesn't love us. And so many people struggle with that. And I think they need to know these, these lessons from the book of Job and many other places throughout the Bible. But I think it's interesting. I said that it would connect up to the first ones about knowing that God is real. Do you know that there, I said that a lot of people turn, they start questioning when bad things happen. But do you know that even people like Charles Darwin, do you know Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, at one, he, I think he was a minister's child. He had a faith in a faith in God, and was you know in a broad sense of the of the word a Christian, believing Christian, faithful person. And then his mother died, and then he, it's like he just could not reconcile the bad things in his life with the loving God. And there are so many times that that happens, and people just say that can't possibly go together and we need to study and know that that those things very often do go together that God can still you know the, at the end of the job I'm getting off on the rabbit trail I told you I'd talk too much but at the end of the book of Job what was the point after after God uh, after Job he allowed Job to maybe say his piece you know Job only wanted an audience with God he kept saying, I just wanted to tell God that I haven't done anything. You know, his friends were convinced that he had done something wrong. He just wanted to say, I haven't done anything. I want to just tell God that I know it's like he's made a mistake because God is good. And surely he wouldn't do this to me. And he just wanted to make like God's made a mistake here. And then basically, 
God <laughs> said, stand up like a man and listen. And he said that you don't know anything. That's pretty much what God told Job. You don't know anything. You don't know. Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did over here? And the point is, there's things going on in this world you can't even understand. Don't put me into that box. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Don't want to be blasphemous here. But God is saying, you don't understand. So don't be going down this road of thinking God is wrong. God did this. When you don't even know and understand how the world works and where, it, you know, all the things in there, here that we still, after years and years, don't know about the world itself, even things we can see. And so I just want my kids to know that they're, they're not going to ever understand completely, probably, everything they need to know about how desperately Satan is after them and why. I don't even understand that really, why he would care. But he cares. There's something there that I would love to learn one day. He, he cares enough to not want me to be with God somehow. He wants me to be, you know, destroyed for some reason. I don't know if it's just out of pure evilness or if it's a game that he is trying to prove to God or something. I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to move on because I could talk too much about that. But the next thing, very for a few minutes, I want to talk about these next few. But... It has to do with uh, what can be controversial, uh, is, um, and it's about roles in our marriage. And I want my daughter to know that it does not make her, uh, or I want her to understand her role in marriage. You know, there are roles in marriage. We can read Ephesians 5, and we know that uh, we are given, you know, the husband is to love his wife. There seems to be a difference here. We're the, right, the wife is to respect her husband. The husband is the head of the wife. There's distinctions there. And the world tries to put men and women on this purely equal basis as far as just alike, you know, that we're just alike. And the Bible doesn't really teach that. I don't believe that we're not equal, but what I'm saying is I think that we are different uh, in that we have different roles um, and then along with that I want her to know that it does not make her weaker to submit in marriage so I'm saying about three in a row here and I want my son to know that he is not toxic because he's trying to be the leader of a household I don't want him growing up thinking that I want you to turn first of all to a uh, well, I mentioned Ephesians 5, so we won't read that, but that I want my children to know that God himself says this is what a husband does, this is what a wife does, and that the husband is the head of the wife, like Christ is the head of the church. Um, and then I want us briefly to look at Philippians chapter 2, since we are women, and I want us to be teaching our, da our daughters more of this. Philippians chapter 2, let me get over there. Philippians chapter 2 begins with, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, and any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more, count others more significant than yourselves. And let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. So this whole chapter 2 begins with the importance of showing humility and that we're not the person we should be concerned about, right? We should be showing that to others and putting their needs in front of our own. But then um, verse 5 brings it home by saying, Having had this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Christ is the ultimate example of showing humility by putting others' needs in front of his own, putting his needs as secondary, and then it lays it out so specifically how he shows us this the best by saying, who, though he, that's Jesus, was in the form of God, and that means the image and the essence of God, uh, he did not count it equality, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So imagine Jesus being equal with God. Just have that image in your mind. He did not 
count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But then God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. And the marriage, our marriages, and I was going to say this earlier, I don't mind talking about marriages at a parenting uh, seminar because parenting and family is highly dependent on good marriages. I mean, the, your success, I'm not saying that you cannot be a good parent, you know, if you didn't have a good marriage. I know there's, I don't know who I'm talking to in here, and I don't want to imply that at all, but I'm saying that your marriage can affect your family. I think most of us would agree, that, would agree with that. It can make it better or worse, and it makes your children healthier or not as healthy in all different ways. So I want this to be something my children know. I want Mary Carol for sure to know that that when she submits to uh, her husband, when that day comes and she gets married and she agrees to submit herself, that she's really picturing, she's really showing the picture of Christ to the world because she is equal. There's not, there's not a uh, you know, a hierarchy as far as men are not inherently smarter or, you know, they're not tougher or in any, we're just different, right? And so it doesn't mean, but the world is going to try to teach our daughters and our sons that that is an inferior thing. But when we read Philippians chapter 2, it doesn't seem to me that that was inferior for Jesus to humble himself, Right? He was equal with God, but he didn't hold on to that. He didn't think that was worth being grasped for because he wanted to humble himself, and he did it for us. He died on the cross. That's what that was the purpose. Our purpose is to humble ourselves to show submission to our husbands because, for one, it's commanded, but also because it, it, it presents the picture of Christ and the church and Christ and God to the world. In fact, that's what Ephesians chapter 5 says. That this is all a mystery about husbands and wives. But I'm saying, Paul says, that it refers to Christ and the church. Well, that's the whole point. And I don't want her to, to think that there's something, you know, that makes her weaker about that. Do we ever think Jesus is weaker because he left heaven to die for us? That he put himself under us? We don't think that. And I don't know why women would think that it makes you weaker to take that role in a, when you... A, Agree or choose to to put yourself under. That's what submission means. You rank yourself under. It's like a military term. Um, and so I want Mary Carol to be familiar with those thoughts, and I want to take her to scripture. Um, so real quickly too, I want my children to know. These are random, by the way. If you can't tell, I want my children to know to be nice to speaking to people. I want them to speak to people and to smile at people. And that might seem like a no-brainer, but there are a lot of children seem that they, they do not know how to speak to you, how to be nice. I know there's, I, I won't, well, I won't say that. I just know some children that when you speak to them, they just walk right by. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, I want to do jumping jacks when they just get their attention. But we need to teach them common courtesies like that and, and make you know, yeah, make them do that and maybe swat them on the behind if they're rude and bring them right back and say, Miss Sister Smith just spoke to you. I think we should be doing that with our children, even when they're little, to let them grow up because they're going to get awkward as they get older. It gets a lot harder at 10 and 11 and 12 to make them speak if you haven't been doing that when they're 2 and 3 and 4. If you do that when they're younger, it you have to dig in and keep making them do it, but it's not near as earth-shattering to them to have to open up their mouth and say, hello. <laughs> I don't know why that's so hard. But, but anyway, I want my children also, I want them to know that the people who've gone before them were not stupid. Now, this is a maybe a little bit more politically incorrect and, you know, like more cultural to our, our specific culture, but I think we're really fighting an epidemic of superiority and people who are older somehow were just terrible, awful people. They didn't know enough. They didn't, they weren't nice enough. And those are the people our kids are listening to. 
I hate to tell you, but those are the people that are doing the influencing on Instagram and, and doing the little things that they listen to all the time. The celebrities, you know, those are the thoughts that are hitting our kids. And I want my kids to know that people, and well, I don't mind insulting sometimes even my own children, but uh, they're usually very much more smart than you are. <laughs> you know, they know a lot more than you know. So the uh, best way I think you can do this is and this is not necessarily a spiritual thing, but I still, I mean, it's spiritual that you shouldn't think people who are older, you should show respect. But, but I think the best way to do this is to teach them history. Put those documents in their hand, and when they don't understand them, say, well, that's kind of the point. These people were very smart. And here's what this means. Let me explain to you, dear one, what that word means. That you, you know, maybe they need a healthy dose of that. That these people knew what they were talking about. They had thoughts, and they were brilliant. And and you know, you might not have, to, you might not agree with them, but you cannot say someone is stupid because they have a different idea than you do. Um, and so, give them articles and publications that are older than them. I'm on a personal goal to acquire books here lately. And we love going to a place like McKay's and you know there's one in Nashville and Knoxville and Chattanooga and it's just old books. You can buy old books for really cheap and I, a few years ago I thought you know I would really like to buy some old books knowing that they're less and less appreciated because at least I would have a copy of one you know and things are they're not printed anymore and you can't get a hold of them maybe as much anymore and so I want that to be something I'm passing down to my children is that there were people we can learn from and we should fill our minds with their their intellects and and grow our minds by reading things like that um, and that starts again when they're younger by by teaching them to respect older people by teaching them to open doors you know maybe stand at church and open the door maybe they are helping an older per lady get out of the car even when they're younger and hold their bag or their bible while they walk into church just little things they can make them see older people as a hurt as people um so that's maybe the, you know around halloween make them take treats to some of the older people who can't get out and let them experience seeing a kid in their little costume or something that shows them that the people are important all right and then uh, really quickly i want them to know um, about appropriate behavior between the sexes um, of course we know that there's so much trouble that kids can get into in this area not you know it takes us just teaching them it takes us being you know taking a breath being embarrassed and just saying the words. And I remember having a talk with my daughter in a car when she was about 12 years old about appropriate touching. And I wanted her to know that that goes beyond the whole sick pervert that you know you don't even know, but that this still applies to a little boyfriend you have. I want you to know that this is appropriate and this over here is not. And I looked over and her eyes were just like, and I thought, well, this is what they say it's like. And here I am. I thought, oh, she'll just see, we'll just have the camaraderie. She'll just be so respectful of me for letting know. She was totally embarrassed. <laughs> and I thought, well, because I was like, here's where he should not touch you. And, you know, she was only 12, but that, it happens when they're little. It happens on a church bus. It happens at a youth rally. It happens at the, the youth lock-in or whatever. You know, it happens, and we think, oh, they're so little. Not everybody at that places will be little, and they need to know that sometimes I want, especially that, you know, this still applies when you think he's cute and you think he kind of likes you, that that's still not appropriate. We need to be telling girls that just plainly, plainly tell them that. They may make mistakes, but don't let it be because you never said that's wrong. You do not need to let somebody do that to you, you know. And then, and I also want, I want her both of my children to know but these are tailored i guess more to, to uh, girls but that i want her to know she's worth more than her sexual being or her physical body um there's more to her than that how she acts her 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 soul her personality her intellect everything about her that is important and it's not she's just not what she looks like on the outside 
We have to speak those words plainly to our, to our girls and our boys. They need to know that about themselves, but they need to know that about girls, too. You know, our boys need to be told she's a person. She's not just a body walking around. She's got feelings, and you treat her with respect. And that starts when they're little all the way up through puberty, and we need to be telling them this over and over. And I also want her to know that anyone who would uh, compromise her purity does not love her. That there is no reason in the world that you could tell yourself that somebody who, you know, is trying to get you to go against God's law, they don't, they may be making a mistake themselves. And it may be, I mean, I'm not, I know people make mistakes. You know, I, I get it. But, but when you're talking to her, I want her to know that they're not really loving you like they need to if they're trying to pressure you like that. And I want my son to know the same thing. If a girl's pressuring him, that any girl that's wanting to go uh, moving too fast in, in ways that are inappropriate is not the kind of girl he, that would be faithful to him. That, she, you know, maybe she's uh, not focused on the right things. I know kids grow up and all of that, but that's still good for them to be hearing. They need to understand. And along with this, we need to be telling our kids that sex is for marriage. If we don't say those words, the world is surely not telling them that. I mean, every, everything they see on TV, every even shows that we may think are harmless, have two people in the bed together that aren't married, and they know that. And when we're not saying, oh, that's wrong. Um, one thing I remember about my mom is that, you know, everybody has their standards about what we watch, and I, I know everybody makes their, but, you know, she would never let us watch things that were bad and dirty and, you know, with length, but, but she wasn't also a stickler for, like, if there was one word, so, you know, well, turn that off, we're not watching that show ever again, you know, she was, I think, pretty good, at, but I remember pl plenty of times, you know, she was like this commentary going on through the show, she was using each little scene to teach a lesson, like a little smart mouth girl, like, mm, she, sh mm, she shouldn't have been saying that, you know, <laughs> like, and I was like, okay, you know, so we knew, like, that was wrong, oh, she shouldn't have done that, oh, she's going to get in trouble for that, you know, he, he was mean, wasn't he, you know, and so I think we can use things like that to teach our kids, but make sure we're actually saying the words, tell them, our kids should not think, and I really think most of them think, that sex, and we live in a society that's saying, that sex is for the young, the fit, the people who really love each other, and then if you get married, it just kind of fizzles out. That's a shame. It's a shame when we live that way, and here's a spoiler. We're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow. I'm going to go home and, or go back to the room and get my nerve up, but we're going to talk a little bit about that relationship uh, because it's important to your family and to your children even. Just stay with me there. Don't That can be misunderstood I guess but anyway so I want them to know that this is truly for marriage and God made it for marriage it's good for marriage it's not for the people who aren't married uh, and then I want my children to know that marriage is for life uh, we have been struck in our family more than once in our mine and Adam's family with uh, divorce adultery and it's not fun I heard something one time, and uh, they, I remember, I can't remember exactly the words, but it was like, you know, marriage is hard. Divorce is hard. And then it was just one statement at the end, choose your hard. And I know, I know that there are things that happen in marriages. It's not always, it's just cut and dry, and there are so many things that can happen. But I'm talking to us in a general way of that we need to tell our kids that marriage isn't easy. It's not all fun. You're going to want to kill each other sometimes. and You're going to be mad at each other. Maybe your feelings are hurt, really. Maybe you've really truly been betrayed. Um, and I'm not even talking about adultery here. I'm talking about maybe you've just been betrayed in different ways and you feel maybe the person was in the wrong, but marriage is hard and you 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 try to keep coming back together. And I'm not talking about, I know, I think we all understand, it seems like whenever you try to talk about some just hard truths, 
that caveats start flowing. And I think we're all smart enough to know that there are things that, you know, I'm not talking about someone who's being abused, staying in a marriage and risking their life. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff, but I'm just talking about the daily ins and outs of marriage of when people just decide they don't love each other anymore or they decide that that person over there is really going to make me happier than my husband over here. And we just, because of the daily things in marriage that are hard, you know, you're not going to help your life any by ending your marriage just because it's a hard and you're not in love anymore or you don't get along anymore because divorce is hard too. It's hard on your family. It breaks hearts. It's hard on your children. It's hard on your parents. It's hard on your siblings. It's just hard. And so choose your heart. Do the hard work of making marriages better and digging in and, and learning and getting counseling and doing everything you can. Um, and so I think that's important to teach our kids to do that too. And I want them to know love is an action. It's not a feeling. And I want my daughter, these are fun. I want my daughter to learn how to cook. I just want her to know how to cook. I don't want her to think that, that it's not important. I think it's very important. It's a very womanly trait to know how to cook. At least some basic, simple things. We'll talk about why tomorrow, so come back. Um, and I want my son to know how to hold down a job. I don't, I don't want him to be a lazy person. I want him, I believe the Bible teaches men to be providers. Uh, we know that the Bible says that if a man does not provide for his own family, he's worse than an infidel. That is pretty hard language, isn't it? Provide. I want him to know he's a provider for his family. And I, um, and I want, I believe, and I've already mentioned this, I want my son to know how to treat women. And I've already mentioned that a lot. But tomorrow we're going to talk about how nurturing brings peace to your family. And what that, exa what that means exactly. And we're also going to be talking about how to balance a busy life. Because sometimes when you hear these lessons, I know I do. You know, I've seen a lot of you taking notes. And there's a lot to think about. There's so many things we want to be better at. And I know I have felt before, like, I can never do this right. I'll never make all of these improvements that I feel like I need to make. And a lot of times, um, we just need to remember that it is a, an act of balance to be able to work on something and get it get it all in and then know exactly how to do that without harming something else and so uh, that's that'll be an interesting lesson tomorrow to balancing a busy life thank you so much i think i only went five minutes over so that's not too bad